Well, welcome to this edition of Real Life. And we're very excited to have back with us Jay Smith from London, England. Uh, Jay Smith is an expert in Islamic theology. He is uh, being used by God all around the world. An amazing man, born on the mission field, a third generation missionary, born in India. Uh, as I said, resides in London, England today. Uh, but he's an American. Uh, but more than that, uh, above all that, he's a Christian. And he's my brother. And I love it. But uh, today, Jay is going to be talking to us about something where you need to pay close attention. This is absolutely awesome because what Jay is revealing from his studies and from his knowledge of Islam in light of looking at it through not only the Christian uh, world or biblical worldview, but using the Word of God, which we all should be doing, he's going to be speaking to us regarding what the Quran is all about. Can it be trusted? Is it faithful? Is it reliable? Is it uh, greater than the Bible? He's going to be speaking to that, and he's going to be speaking to the topic of who really is Muhammad. And if you can take on these two issues, Muhammad and the Quran, is there anything left to support Islam? Well, listen, he's going to be talking to us, and I hope you enjoy the program. And I think, in fact, I know that you will. Jay, it's great to have you back with us. Jack, it's good and to be here. I tell you what, I kind of want to stay out of the way and let you do your thing, but uh, I'll be here with you. Yeah, let me just bounce you off okay, of you and let's, let's work it right there. Let's get back to those two things. Yes. Basically, Islam lives or falls on Muhammad and the Quran. Sure. If they don't have the book, they don't have the man, what is Islam? Mm. Islam is defunct. It's the same way with Christianity. That's right. We live or fall on the Bible and Jesus Christ. So, much the same, the same paradigms. Now, when you look at Jesus Christ, we pretty well know who he is. There's lots of biographies written about him. Sure. In fact, we know of four biographies written about him. Yes. Two by eyewitnesses. That's right. And two by those who got it from the eyewitnesses. That's correct. And they, got, they wrote exactly what they saw and what they heard. So the biography would be what they saw Jesus do and what they heard would be the sayings of Jesus. Yes. Okay, that's the Siddha of Jesus and the Hadith of Jesus sure. in the Arabic talk context. Sure. Now the same thing exists for Islam. You've got to have what Muhammad did and what he said. So who are the ones that wrote down what Muhammad did? Do you know any names? I don't. No, you wouldn't. But Muslims will. And Muslims will say, yes, we know what Muhammad did because we have the Siddha of Muhammad written by a man named Ibn Hisak, who actually we don't have his material, but it was his disciple that wrote it down, and his name was Ibn Hisham. Hmm. And Muslims will say, Ibn Hisham tells us what Muhammad did. And what Muhammad did, we're to do. And we follow what Muhammad did. And the same way we would say, of following what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, what Jesus does, we do. What he says, we say. Sure. Okay, there's the, the parallels. The problem is, Ibn Hisham wrote this down in 833. Muhammad died in 632. Oh, yeah. You've got a problem. That's right. So it takes 200 years to write down what Muhammad did. 200 years. What did Muhammad say? Well, that's first written down by a man named Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is the name every Muslim will know. Now, you don't know this name, but every Muslim will know this name. Al-Buhari, Sahih Buhari. It, Sahih means perfect, nothing wrong in what he said. These are the sayings of Muhammad. He was given 600,000 sayings and he was to whittle them down and to throw out anything that was wrong and he brought it down to 7,397. So basically, he threw out 98% mm -hmm. and only kept 2%. Mm -hmm. But when did he do this? 870 is when he died. 870, Muhammad died in 632. Yeah. Can you see the problem? Yes, it's forming, absolutely. Can you see the difficulty with Muhammad right away? What do we know about Muhammad? The only thing we know about Muhammad is what Muslims tell us. And the only thing they have is not written down for 200 years after he died. And the only thing they know about what he said is written 240 years. Now, there are many other hadith that come after Bukhari. We have Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Diyamidi, and any other, many other. But they come after Al-Bukhari. And there are other siddhas that come after mm -hmm. Ibn Hisham. Al-Waqidi is another one. But they come after 833. Nothing comes before the 9th century for a man that was living in the 7th century. Wow. Now, if you were to do a comparative, if, if we were going to demand the same thing of Jesus Christ and have the same categories, we would know nothing about Jesus Christ until the 3rd century. That's right. Nothing about mm. what he said or what he did. Mm. Does that bother you? That bothers me. How would you know what he did or said? Right. See, that's what Muslims have not answered yet. They haven't even begun to answer that yet. And so we're saying, hold on a minute. That's right. If everything your prophet did and everything he said is not written down for two to three hundred years later, why? Why do we have to wait so long? And what about the people that were living at that time? The mm. people that were being conquered by him, the people that actually were his companions, did they not write it down? Like the companions of Jesus. Right. Those, who, those would be the guys I'd want to hear from. You would want to hear from them. Absolutely. So their answer is, well, they didn't write it because they couldn't read or write. Now stop and ask yourself, hold on a minute. If I had a map here, just imagine 
Islam, what Islam does. Islam begins basically right after the Prophet died. All he controlled was the central part of Arabia. But within two caliphs, by mm -hmm. the time of uh, Abu Bakr and Umar, as when Umar comes to power in 634, between 634 and 644, in that 10 year old period, he controls, he destroys Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. The five great cities of the Levant, he destroys within 10 years of Muhammad's death. Mm. Now, you could, are you telling me no one could read or write in those five cities? Exactly, exactly. There were no libraries? Absolutely, some of the greatest in the world. Well, even that, what about this book here? Yeah, wow. Wasn't this book written down mm. almost immediately after his death? Doesn't Al-Buhari tell us that? Even Al-Buhari says it's written down by a man named Zaid ibn Thabit, and he writes it down, and that copy was then put under the bed of Hafsa, one of Muhammad's wife, and it stayed there for 18 years, and then in 650, it was reprised, brought back out by Uthman, the third caliph, and he wants to rewrite it again. What do you mean rewrite? You have to write if you're rewriting. Who was Zaid ibn Thabit? He was a, a secretary of Muhammad. How can you be a secretary if you can't read or write? Exactly. So even that excuse doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. So we're asking a very poignant question. Hold on a minute. Why do we have to wait for two to three hundred years of, to find out about this man, Muhammad? And more than that, what about this book? Hmm. What about this book? See, this is the real king pit because Muhammad is nothing without this book. If there is no Quran and if Muhammad is not the one that, that this book is given to, right. he is the one that receives this book. They tell us from 610 to 632, that, uh, that 23 year period, he receives these revelation. Hmm. If that is so, then where are and where is that revelation? Right. Why didn't he write it down? Well, they, they say because he couldn't read or write. He was illiterate. Others had to write it down. Okay, so where did those others write it down? Because we do know that it was written down by Zaid ibn Thabit. I'm right. quoting their sources, okay? Right, right, right. Their sources from the 9th century tell us it was a man named Zaid ibn Thabit who wrote it down. So it must be somewhere by the time of Uthman. It must be somewhere by the time of 650. And that's the date that every Muslim knows this book was finally yeah. written down. 650, 18 years after Muhammad's death. Yeah. Mid 7th century. Hold that number in your head. Okay. So 650, that's pretty recent. That that's is. only 1,400 years ago. That's right. We want to talk about the Bible. Is yeah, the Bible written down almost immediately? Yes, it is. Yes. Do we have any of the manuscripts? Yes. Do we have complete manuscripts? I no. believe, well, okay. Not from the first century. Okay. We have 12 manuscript evidences, uh, par uh, parcel ma uh, uh, ma ma manuscripts, 12 of them from the second century. Yeah. We have 68 from the third century, and we have another 46 from the fourth century. That's 124 manuscripts, not complete, yeah. but if you put them all together, yes. you can reproduce the New Testament several times over. Yeah. And then we have the Sinaiticus, the Sinaiticus in 350 AD, right. some say 325, the fourth century, the entire 27 books. Yeah. That's 300 years before the Quran. Why is it we can put together 230 manuscripts or partials or complete manuscripts by the 6th century of the New Testament alone? Mm. And after that, we have a whole proliferation of manuscripts. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin there Vulgates, another 9,000 right. in other languages. That's 24,000 manuscripts right. that date all the way, that we can trace all the way back to the 2nd century. That's right. And why can't Islam come up with one? We're just asking for one manuscript. Wow. One manuscript of the Quran in the seventh century. Now remember, they control Basra, Baghdad, Damascus. These are big the cities. Great, yeah, absolutely. By 661, they were now moving across North Africa, right. destroying the church as they went. By the end of the seventh century, by the time of Abdul Al Malik, I want you to repeat that name, Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik. That's right, Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik. Abd means the, the, the father of Al Malik. Okay. okay, now Father Abdul Al Malik, just remember Al Malik. Okay. Very important name. He was the caliph that ruled from 685 to 705, the end of the 7th century up into the beginning of the 8th century. This name is going to become more and more important as we continue. I'm just going to introduce it in this mm. talk because we're going to hear about it from years to come. Because it's he, it is he that creates what we know as the Arab identity. He's the caliph there in Damascus, controls Islam. He is the one that builds the Dome of the Rock that big edifice sure. in Jerusalem, the largest edifice of its time. He writes inscriptions on the inner ambulatory. Sure. Those are Quranic inscriptions, are they not? Right, right. Ooh, yeah, they are, but they don't agree with the Quran we have today. Interesting, how what's so, more, how so? What's more, they don't, not only they, they don't agree, they don't have anything to say why that building was built. Because everybody, every Muslim will tell you that building was built to commemorate when Muhammad went up to the seven, Correct. the seven heavens, and that. when he met with Allah, came down to heavens. I won't go into that story. It's called the Miraj. The midnight ride. The, there the you go. Barak, the That's not written anywhere on that ambulatory. Those ambulatories only talk about, really, really, they talk about Jesus Christ, and they introduce Muhammad as a prophet. That's the first time we find any reference to Muhammad as a prophet in the Dome of the Rock. 
by Abd al-Malik. He then makes some coins. That's built in 691. He makes some coins in 692 that also introduce Muhammad as a prophet. So the first reference we have to Muhammad as a prophet is by Abd al-Malik in 691 and in 692. Hmm. Now, there have been a lot of scholars who are now looking to this and say, this is a problem. This has got a real problem because they have now looked at the Caliph of Protocols, Dr. Uh, Yehuda Nevo, did this at the University of Jerusalem. He looked at all the Caliph protocols of the Sufyani period, of the Umayyad period. From the Sufyani period, they took over in 661, up until the time the Marwans took over, and Marwans took mm -hmm. over in around 660, 680, sorry, and then, of course, Abdul Malik took over in 685. And they looked at all the Caliph protocols. These are the official documents of the Caliphs. Nowhere in any of these documents does it refer to Muhammad as a prophet. Yet these are the first Muslims. Nowhere is there any reference to people called Muslims. Yet supposedly these are the first Muslims. Right. Nowhere is there any reference to any religion called Islam. Hmm. The word Muslim, the word Islam, and Muhammad as a prophet were introduced by Abd al-Malik. We can't find anything before 691. Now, wow. what did they call themselves? Who were these people that were going and right. destroying yes. these cities? Right. They called themselves Saracens. They called themselves Maghrites. They called themselves Ishmaelites. They call ah, themselves Hagarins. No they call themselves Muhajirun. Those are the five words they refer to themselves. Sarasan is the name for Arabs. A Maghrite is the place they come from. An Ishmaelite and a Hagarin are the people that come in the line of Ishmael through Hagar sure. back to Abraham. Sure. Arabs come in that line. Right. And Muhajirun are people who are nomadic. Hajar on an exodus. They're always moving. But nowhere do they call themselves Muslims. So the documentation we're getting from the 7th century completely confronts what Muslims have been telling us for, we thought 1400 years, it looks now 1200 years. Because everything we know about Islam or the Muslims or the Quran comes from these traditions that were first written down by Ibn Hisham, Al-Waqidi, Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim in the 9th century and redacted back onto the 7th century. So hold that because yeah. now it really gets juicy. <laughs> Here comes the big part. So where is this book then? If Muhammad is not there, not, we don't know anything about Muhammad until 691. That's 60 years after he died. Mm -hmm. He died in 632. It takes him 60 years to finally refer to him as a prophet. Now I can imagine, can you imagine the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John not There's referring no to Jesus Christ? Uh, no way. Until the end of the first century? There's no reference to him anywhere right, from all. any Christian sources? Can right. you imagine what would we do? We wouldn't have much of a gospel to talk about, That's would right. we? Or a person to refer That's to. Right. Yet Muslims have never admi had, have admitted it. They have not looked at the dates. But here's the big problem, and here's the thing that I've, we've always asked. Okay, let's, we have a problem with Muhammad, but let's talk about the Quran. When was this book then written? They will say it's written in 650 by Abd al Malik. I'm sorry, not by Abd al Malik, by um, Zaidi bin Tabit, under the authority of Uthman. Okay. And then he took three other men to help him, Z uh, Zubair, Alas, and Harith. The four of them rewrote the Quran in 650, all right? Where is that Quran that they rewrote? Because then it says in Al-Buhari that four copies were made. One was left there in Medina, one was sent to Basra, one was sent to Damascus, one was sent to Baghdad. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and Medina. Four copies. Mm -hmm. These are big cities. Muslims controlled it by that time. Mm -hmm. Where are those copies? Now for years, for 30 years that I've been working with Muslims, they say two of those copies still exist. And here's one of them right here. This is called the Topkapi Manuscript. This is the Topkapi Manuscript that you find in the Topkapi Museum in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey. This is considered to be that Uthmanic recension. According, if you look here, I don't know if, you can, if the camera can zoom in on it, there's some blood stains right there. Yeah. That's the blood stains of Uthman. When he was reading, he was killed, and those were his blood stains. And Muslims have always said this is the Uthmanic recension. This is the first Quran. This is the one that was written by Zaidi bin Tabit under the authority of Uthman 18 years after Would Muhammad. all Muslims agree with what you just said? Every Muslim. Okay. This is the only one they've ever looked at, and the other one is this one, the Samarkand. These are the two manuscripts that they say are the earliest okay. of those four. This is the Samarkand manuscript in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. Now, do they look the same to you? They look very much the same. Uh, how many lines are there? Oh, there's many lines on and there. And how many lines are not, there? Not many. Can you see? Yeah. Already, they're not the, the same. The font looks the same, but outside of that, this, this, yeah. It looks quite different. Quite different. 
none of us have really had any chance to look at them. We've not been able to really dispute it or dis, uh, uh, to confront it. I've debated this over the years. I've done about 80 debates with Muslims. About a third of the debates have been about the Quran. And we've had to debate these two all the time. I've always tried to say, well, there's nothing I can do. I'd love to do some forensic evidence on them, do some accelerated mass spectrography. Nobody can touch them. Nobody's allowed to look at them. We've just had to take them their word for it until 2002. 2002, two men were given access to this manuscript. This one here and this one. Their name is, and I'm going to get it right, it is Professor Dr. Ekmeladin Isanoglu and Dr. Tayar Altukulic. These are the scholars in Turkey who have had access to this manuscript. They're Muslims, they're Turkish, this is in Turkey, this is their manuscript. Why would they give them access? Because they own it. They control it. They are the only ones that have done any forensic testing on it, and they've spent five years looking at these two manuscripts. Guess what they have found? Now, I've got all their quotes here. It's too much for you to, to go through all this material here. Sure. They're now saying that this is not Uthmanic. This is 8th century. They're dating this one to mid-8th century. Mid-8th century. Muhammad died in mid-7th century. The Quran was put together in the mid-7th century. They're putting this back about 100 years. Anywhere from 60 to 100 years. This one, they say, this one's absolutely hopeless. They said it is full of manuscript variants. It has all kinds of grammatical mistakes. Whoever wrote it did not know Arabic very well. Interesting. It only goes up to Surah 43. Ooh, two, 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 two. Yeah. <laughs> There's 114 surahs. Yeah. It's not even complete. This one, they're also saying, this one has 2,217 manuscript variants from the Quran we have today. Not only is it too late, it also is not a complete Quran. Yeah. And it's not the same Quran we have but today. But this is considered by many or by all as the source. This are the two sources. This is where you're going to go back to, but they contradict one another and they leave out what we have today. More than that, the they are all 8th century. 8th century. Eighth the century, date's wrong. 8th century. Now, there are four others that they have looked at. The Husseini manuscript in Egypt. They're saying this is 8th century. The Paris Polypatinius uh, manuscript in Paris. 8th century. The Ma'il Quran in London, late 8th century. Interesting. And the newest one, the most controversial, the Sana manuscript, found in Yemen. This is the only one that they are willing to say could have begun in the last two decades of the 7th century. Who was ruling in the last two decades of the 7th century? Abd al-Malik. Interesting. This is the one that he introduced. We have nothing earlier than this Quran which means no Quran exists now from the 7th century. We cannot find one Quran at all from the 7th century. All these Qurans that they have been saying for the last 1,200 years are Uthmanic. Not one of them is Uthmanic. They're all 60 to 100 years later, and none of them agree. What are Islamic scholars saying about this? Are they... Well, I just found out about it in May. I went and did a debate in June 22nd uh, with Anand Rashid, who's considered probably one of the best debaters in Britain today, on the Bible and the Quran. He let me go first. He shouldn't have done that because I just introduced this material to him. He had no response. He had no idea what or where to go with it. He got up there and he said, I have a coin here, Mr. Smith, and it's got Quranic material on it from the seventh century, proving you're wrong. I said, no, I know who that coin is. In fact, look and see who minted that coin, Abdullah Malik. That coin was minted by him in 691. It's in the British Museum. And it's the first reference do we have to the Prophet Muhammad. You just made my point. It's Abdullah Malik that introduces the, the Quran. We have no Quran before so, Abd al-Malik. So now stop and think the implications. Abd al-Malik comes to power in 685. Muhammad dies in 632. That means it takes them 60 years to even begin a Quran. So what's the conclusion? Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. The Quran now is suspect. And everything I have just quoted to you are on the back of this. And everything I'm quoting to you comes from Islamic Awareness website. This is the largest Muslim website. They are now agreeing that not one of these manuscripts come from the seventh century. What's what's the word on the street, as it were, for the Muslim? What are they talking? What are they? Well, what are I they went thinking? to Speaker's Corner. Oh, in London. Mid July. Sure. Two weeks after I did that debate, I went and introduced this at Speaker's Corner. The Muslims were so angry. Did they even know what you're talking about? They, they knew exactly what I'm really? talking about, and that's why if Muslims are watching this, they need to understand the implications. 
an Albanian Muslim just came and he slammed me. I went flying. I went flying off the ladder. My glasses went one way. I got back up again, put the glasses back on. And I just held it back up again. And he took it and he crumpled it in his hands. But it's made out of the, the one he did. The, this is the second one he now. He just couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle that. it. And he the police could. had to come and finally arrest him. He got so angered. But see, here's the problem. What would you do in their place? What would you do as a Muslim if you're hearing this? If I were a Muslim hearing this, I would probably come up to your, you on your ladder and knock you off your ladder. Because I what mean, you, you are hitting, you're taking, you're taking everything that I've ever known out from underneath. This is destroys the Quran Completely. and it destroys Muhammad, uh, the Prophet Muhammad in one fell swoop. This is a game changer. And this is the first time now that we can quote Muslims. See, this is all done. Everything I've got written on here, and I'll give you this. Everything I've got written on here is from Muslim sources. This is not done by Europeans. This is not done by Americans. It's not done by me. And there's nothing I've said in the last they don't 20 have. minutes that anybody can't say. So Abdul Malik? Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is then the, um, in some ways, a creator, mar marketeer. Uh, he is the one that creates the Arab identity. We always know him as a great... He creates the, the, the term Muslim, the prophet. Why would you do that? Now stop and think. And this, let's do a quick well, historical too. survey. If you have a man named Muhammad. Now, that's not, we're not saying Muhammad didn't exist. Understood. We sure. do have references to him. We understand that. The doctrine that. Iacobi in the British Museum refers to yeah, him in 634. No he did exist. And what did he do? He was one that started the Arab conquests. Yes. We do know that. one, And that's yes. why he's so violent. He was one that created the, 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 the Hijaz as his domain. But he didn't have any Quran. There was no book. So there was no people called Abdul Muslims. Malik he didn't start a religion called Islam. To establish? So once he then dies in 632, then Ab Ab Abu Bakr or Umar, Uthman, they then carry out, move out even further and further. They're taking over right across from North Africa, taking over what the church had been all the way up to Spain in the west and going the other direction all the way to India in the east. So by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, from Spain in the west to, to India in the east, all that land was under their control. They owned a lot of big cities. The problem is they have no identity because all their prophetic material, all the material they're dependent on comes from Judeo-Christian sources. Oh. Everything that they are depending on comes from the Bible. Sure. And they wanted to have an Arab prophet. Am I wrong then to understand that that would explain why the Quran in many areas has borrowed things from the Old and New Testament? Everything because, in there is from borrowed. Because he went from what known sources were to him. He had to use the stories, but look at the to, stories he borrowed. Yeah. They're not from the Old and New Testament. That's where I'll correct you. There are, They're apocryphal writings. Interesting. Because that's the only material they had access to. So Surah 3, Surah ah. 5, Ayah 32, the story that I talked about earlier about if he takes the blood of one, takes the blood of all, but yeah, he was saved, yeah, that yeah. comes from the Bar Sanhedrin, fifth century. The story yeah. about, I'm sorry, uh, the story about, the, the story that precedes it in verse 31 is the story of Cain and Abel and the raven. That comes from the, uh, the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah. The story of Abraham in Surah 21. 51 to 71, verses 51 to 71, that comes from the mission of Rabbah. So it's an amalgamation of things that existed and, he, and he used that. He began it. So Abdul but Malik, he didn't this finish is a, it. Yeah. Because we can't find one manuscript wow. that is complete until the ninth century. So what It do you begins in the eighth century and it finishes possibly the ninth. We don't even know that. It could be not to the 10th century that it's finished. We still have an awful lot of work to do. Jay, we've got to wrap this up. Listen, what are you doing to get this word out? This is the biggest revelation regarding This is a game Islam. chamber. This is a game changer. This is going to destroy Islam historically. And I'm quoting their own, sources their own sources because it destroys the Quran from coming from Muhammad. It says the Quran is not even begun until 60 years later by Abdul al-Malik. And it takes away Muhammad. Basically, any proof that he's not only not a prophet, what does he do then? And what's the purpose of Muhammad? Oh, amazing. Listen, friends, you've been listening to Jay Smith, and you heard him say a moment ago, which for some of you, maybe you're doubting what you're hearing, but Jay said it in his, in his own words, uh, citing the documentation he has behind him, that these are Islamic sources. And so listen, for those of us who are witnessing and sharing the gospel with Muslims, let's remember they need Jesus, the real Jesus of the Bible. They need real salvation, not one that is humanly attempted or earned, but one that is a gift, free gift. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that could be you right now, would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the very sacrifice for your sin and mine. And think about it, if you're a Muslim watching right now, you have no hope of that. You have no assurance of salvation. Mm. Jesus Christ 
is not only your assurance, you need to receive him. And that would mean that you would come the way that we've all come. That is acknowledging that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says he is and that you would submit yourself, listen, not to some totalitarian rule and fear and insecurity, but you would submit yourself to his amazing love and forgiveness, his grace. And I'm asking you to do that. Right where you're at, wherever you are in the world, you can say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I believe the Bible. I believe what it says about you. I believe that you are my gift for eternal life. And if you're praying that prayer, we would love to hear from you. Just let us know. Drop us a line. Email us or contact us. But my friend, I want to encourage you. It's this reason for having Jay on and other speakers like we've had that you would understand and know the real God. So today, put your trust in him. Listen, as always, it's our hope that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life. God has a purpose for your family. Turn around at home. The newly released book by Jack and Lisa Hibbs, co-authored with Kurt Bruner, draws from their own inspiring stories. This book will help you understand your emotional, spiritual, and social background. Give biblical encouragement for creating positive cycles in marriage and parenting. Offer practical ideas for becoming intentional parents as couples. Discover family patterns that can be renewed in your generation. Turn around at home. We'll help you make changes for good, starting at home. For your gift of any amount, get your copy of Turn Around at Home. Order online at reallifewithjackhibbs.org or call 877-777-2346. Turn Around at Home. Get your copy today. Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who is searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? We ask that you commit to support Real Life each month with a gift of your choosing. In return, our gift to you for becoming a Real Life partner, we'd like to send you this Worldview DVD. It's titled, What You Believe Defines You. Call now. 1-877-777-2346. That's 877-777-2346. Or by mail, P.O. Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Or simply go to reallifewithjackhibbs.org. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.